Um, so our next speaker is Devin Rogers. He is a botanist with the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. His talk is titled Inventory Monitoring and Management of Rare Plants and Communities in State Nature Preserves and Natural Areas. So this is going to be really interesting and I will let De Devin take it away. <laughs> All right. So hello, my name is uh, Devin Rogers. I'm, I'm a botanist with the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. Um, I'm going to be going pretty quick through a lot of these slides and uh, covering a lot of uh, our recent efforts to Im improve some monitoring um, on some of our nature preserves and, and natural areas where we're doing uh, a lot of management. Okay, uh, just to give you a little background, uh, the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves, uh, we're a state agency that are in charge of uh, maintaining a system of nature preserves and natural areas. Um, we also maintain the state rare plant list, as well as um, listings for natural communities and animals, and that includes uh, conservation ranks and statuses um, for all those. Um, we also maintain a rare species database um, and we protect the state designated uh, Kentucky Wild Rivers. And uh, we also administer the Kentucky Heritage Land Conservation Fund for conservation land uh, acquisition. And this map just kind of shows uh, a, a whole variety of uh, lands that we're involved with. Um, some of them are state nature preserves. Um, and some of them are natural areas. Uh, some of them are areas for which we, uh, we have a conservation easement um, with the Kentucky Heritage Land Conservation Fund, um, as well as uh, some of our Wild Rivers corridors. Uh, we also have a team of dedicated land managers that uh, work on invasive species and removal, um, prescribed fire, and uh, woody removal, uh, as well as you know, maintenance of um, road uh, trails and uh, parking lots. Um, we also have a team of biologists that work to uh, conduct biological surveys, uh, which then feeds back into um, you know applications of management, uh, as well as uh, some of our uh, conservation decisions with uh, ranks and statuses of variety of species. And lastly, we're involved in a lot of public outreach and uh, environmental education and recreation um, on, on uh, some of our nature preserves. We, we maintain a, uh, a rare species database with um, well over 20,000 uh, individual records of uh, plants uh, and aquatic and terrestrial animals, um, as well as natural communities. And then that data uh, not only feeds into things we do within an agency, um, but feeds into a biological assessment tool called the KYBAT, which is a self-service conservation planning tool that allows customers to submit projects and receive data within minutes. And uh, that's available at our website. Now to give a little overview, um, there are six ecoregions well, we you saw we have uh, preserves all over the state, uh, but there are six ecoregions where we have some preserves where we're doing some increased um, um, monitoring and management, places where we've done a lot of management in the past, but we're trying to uh, step up our uh, monitoring efforts because these are some of our um, most important, pristine and sensitive uh, areas. Um, and of the, the places that I'll be talking about today, there's approximately uh, 15 nature preserves and natural areas where we're um, improving some of our uh, monitoring. Um, and of, of these, uh, these nature preserves and natural areas where we're improving our monitoring, also uh, continuing to manage them, um, there's approximately 75 rare and watch list plant species, uh, which are about 13.6% of the track species in the state. 
um, as well as uh, 13 rare communities comprising 36% of the rare communities we recognize. Now, if we go back to the map showing uh, where a lot of our preserves are, um, are highlighted in uh, these, these black polygons, um, some of the areas where we are doing a lot of improved um, monitoring and management. And a lot of these areas were originally identified and protected following the Natural Areas Inventory uh, Program in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. Um, this program uh, attempted to systematically survey the entire state for the most high quality uh, natural areas and um, a, lot of, a lot of the highest quality areas that they, uh, that they recognized uh, ended up becoming nature preserves or uh, conservation easements, natural areas. Um, and during that, that effort, um, there was a lot, of, a lot of original documentation of rare species that formed the, um, the crucial backbone of the rare species database that we continue to build on and monitor today. Um, now, additionally, uh, at the present day, we've inherited you know, a, a years of, of successful management on some of these preserves that we own um, or are involved with. And um, we're trying to just continue that management as well as uh, expand it. Um, and so the focus for, for this talk really is about our efforts to in expand monitoring uh, for our rarest grasslands and wetlands, because these are some of the places that uh, require the most intensive management. And so because there's, um, because there's more frequent um, and more intense uh, management, we wanna make sure that we have um, enough, uh, enough relevant data to be able to assess what we're doing. And uh, lastly, we're just trying to build on the excellent work of previous scientists, land managers, and conservationists. So broadly, are what we wanted to do with some of these places where we're doing a lot of prescribed fire or woody removal is uh, revisit all known rare plant populations to get updated uh, census data and improved mapping. Um, and additionally, we wanted to set out uh, monitoring plots um, where we set up um, 10 by 10 meter plots, 10 by 20 meter plots, 20 by 50 meter plots, different sizes all with the goal of, um, and they're all Carolina Vegetation Survey uh, methodology, um, but all with the goal of capturing cover data for every species in a plot, as well as um, getting rare species data for that plot and taking photos. Um, and these are per permanently marked so we can go back and revisit them as many times as we need to um, in order to monitor uh, changes in vegetation. And another tool we would we want to start using, there's a lot of statistics that you can use with ecological data, um, but we want to start using uh, fluoristic quality assessment. Um, and just very briefly, this is a this is a, um, a statistic uh, that tries to get at the flir fluoristic quality, or basically like how high quality is a natural community based off of the plant species that compose that area. Um, and you can score every species in a flora from zero to 10. Um, those on the lower end being species that uh, are able to tolerate disturbance to natural processes and those that we consider higher quality or have a higher score uh, end up with, uh, uh, or that's because of their intolerance to disturbance of natural processes. Um, and we can, we can take these values in a given plot and add them up for like an average. Um, and then along with uh, richness values, which are the number of species in a plot, um, we can enter them into uh, statistics like the fluoristic quality index, uh, which measures the fluoristic quality. Um, so why is all this important? Um, really uh, s some original records may be mismapped haven't up, been updated in a really long time. Um, and honestly, we can't assess management um, without 
current accurate data. Um, and then when it comes to vegetation monitoring plots, um, rare species don't tell the whole story um, because we're, we're not trying to just manage for the rare species, but for the entire system. Um, and then that quantitative data can serve as a baseline for restoration goals, not only uh, for nature preserves, but also for, um, for other conservation uh, agencies um, around the state. Um, and then the combination of the rare plant data with vegetation data uh, yields a more, more holistic monitoring effort. Um, and then lastly, more botanical research is just needed on protected areas in, in the entire state. So, so far, we've set out a total of 146 plots, um, and you'll see that, you know, 44 of those plots um, have, come, um, have come from our vascular plants out of grasslands. We do have some lichen plots, a couple preserves, um, and then a lot of the other ones uh, come from Appalachian wetlands, like the acid seeps on Pine Mountain and the Cumberland Plateau. So first, I'm going to cover just breeze through a couple neat nature reserves and natural areas for which we actually have some preliminary data. Um, and up in the uh, outer, blue, outer bluegrass, uh, we, have a, we have a preserve um, that hosts a rare community, a globally rare community called the Bluegrass Cat Prairie, where there's 17 track species and we're using a combination of cedar removal, invasive species removal, and prescribed fire uh, to maintain this preserve. Um, so far we set out four vegetation plots and those vegetation plots um, not only are, are trying to assess uh, effects of fire, but also to uh, get community composition, uh, quantitative community composition data on uh, really rare grassland species like the white lady slipper, um, the earleaf false foxglove, and Indian paintbrush. Um, all three of these are just a couple of examples of the rare plants there, but are things for which we have you know, less than five populations in the state. So we're trying to be um, good with uh, making sure that they, they remain healthy going into the future. And uh, here's a, a photo of our bluegrass land manager, uh, uh, Jess Slade, in one of our plots uh, out uh, counting some rare plants. Um, so when we go and look at some of those uh, statistics uh, I was talking about uh, a second ago, um, really we're just establishing a baseline here and we're seeing that, you know, there's, there's pretty high FQI values and uh, going, going into the future, we wanna make sure that if we go back and revisit these plots that uh, the values stay the same. Um, and we'll just use this as, as one of many statistics to, um, to monitor what is happening in the plant communities. Um, some fun things come out of the rare plant updates there include um, this, uh, well, two, two species that had been collected right around 1991 had not been uh, revisited uh, or, or I should say had not been documented again in our natural heritage database. Um, since uh, 1991 so it had been about 30 years, but we were able to uh, refine these this year, including it's called uh, Pecropol percula variety pseudotomentosa poa saltuensis. And not only did we find them, we found uh, we found a couple populations. So that's that's pretty exciting. Uh, and then additionally, um, we're learning that sometimes when we revisit our preserves, that we're still finding rare species that hadn't been documented um, for those preserves. Um, we we're able to find uh, uh, new populations of a rare honeysuckle, Lanissa reticulata, and um, a rare orchid, Leparis lozellii. So in another region of the state, um, one of the natural areas um, in this region is home to uh, 11 state listed species and has a uh, state rare grassland type uh, that we, we call the wet meadow, otherwise known as a zero hydric prairie and we're using um, prescribed fire and uh, woody removal uh, to continue to maintain the open ha habitat there. And this protects um, a couple interesting species like uh, Zyrus torta, Drosera brevifolia, and Asclepius uh, hirtella. And here's, here's a picture of what the habitat looks like. Uh, a lot of that grass that you see in there is uh, 
Andropogon uh, glomeratus. And what's interesting is uh, you see this open grassland and right behind it, there's a closed canopy forest. And if we don't manage this habitat, uh, it will turn into that uh, closed canopy forest. And that is uh, not the right habitat for all the rare plants that occur there. And in November, 2020, uh, just a month ago, we were able to get some prescribed fire uh, in, into the system. And you can just see how many, how many woody stems and saplings are coming up in here, uh, which is what we wanna manage again, against. And we put uh, three plots in the grassland and three plots in the forest uh, just to observe some of the differences. Um, and it, some of it was somewhat predictable from what we're able to qualitatively observe. But, uh, but we were able to see that uh, because of the decrease in tree and shrub cover, um, we have a two to three time increase in the richness or the number of species that can occur in a given area, uh, as well as a, uh, a large increase in the floristic quality index. Um, and then lastly, uh, just further illustrating the point that um, we need management to keep these things open. Um, there's two to six rare plants per plot um, in the grassland and up to 11 in that habitat type, but, um, but zero in the forest. Now another area we're doing um, some interesting work to maintain uh, open habitats uh, is on the Cumberland Plateau, where one of our preserves has uh, five state listed species and one federally listed orchid. Uh, and a uh, state rare, globally rare uh, wetland type called the Cumberland Plateau Forested Acid Seep. Um, so we're, we started out just using woody removal and um, prescribed fire is uh, hopefully uh, gonna happen in the future. Um, so the, uh, this, this habitat protects or a number of rare orchids like the Southern Appalachian endemic white fringes orchid, um, coastal plain uh, species, the yellow crested orchid, and um, another widespread uh, rare acid wetland orchid, uh, tuberous grass plant. So as a result of the natural in inventories, uh, natural area inventories program, they were able to not only uh, identify this uh, rare habitat and um, acquire the land, put, turn it into a preserve, but they use a combination of um, rare plant census data, vegetation plot data, and management. And we're able to really assess uh, how the system changed over time. And they were able to see not only were there in increases in rare species populations with management, um, but also there are increases in uh, floristic richness as well as um, floristic quality. And management is uh, being expanded in the uplands to include um, more, um, or with a lot of, a lot of mid-story removal and um, uh, restoration of uh, short leaf and pitch pine savannas. So we wanna see uh, how these numbers change as we change uh, the rest of uh, the preserve. So in some additional nature preserves uh, where we're, we're also doing work, um, include some work on Pine Mountain where we're trying to keep woody plants from encroaching on uh, some rare wetland types. And uh, we're trying to restore some pine barrens. And these are some photos of uh, some of the plots we've set up on some of the uh, acid seeps that occur on Pine Mountain. And um, while there was already a lot of mapping in some of these systems, we're finding um, that there's, there's a few graminoids that maybe hadn't been recognized, um, but also there's just like, there's some really neat, unique um, vegetation composition. And this is part, this is kind of uh, happening with a pro along with uh, an effort to try and get seeds of rose begonia, try to propagate rose begonia um, from a, the only population in the state, which is on um, acid wetland on private land. We want to try to find a uh, home for it on one of our nature preserves so that it's more protected. 
And then this is just demonstrating some of the management that um, has happened, a lot of prescribed fire and a lot of um, mid-story woody removal, um, trying to restore not only the structure of uh, pitch pine savanna, but also uh, increase the populations of yellow false indigo. Um, we, as, as part of the effort to uh, revisit some of the rare species populations, one of our preserves, we uh, relocated or we, we checked up on a population um, on one of our preserves that uh, we never knew, but we know now because we got updated numbers that it had over 900 plants and it's uh, the largest population of this Baptisia in the state. And then um, out on the Penny Royal Plain, um, we have just preliminary data for one of our preserves. We have 14 track species. Uh, we're using a combination of prescribed fire, cedar removal and invasive species control. And um, we have a couple of vegetation plots, but it's data isn't analyzed yet. Um, so we set up plots on both wet glades uh, as well as dry glades. And um, we were fortunate to have um, Mason Brock, uh, Kentucky native and uh, botanical expert, um, join us on one of our plots where uh, he informed us of something that really ha we hadn't heard about and didn't really know about. Uh, which is the presence of this interesting onion species um, that we suspect is um, either Allium stellatum, which there's been some confusion about whether or not uh, the plant occurs in the state. Um, but as a result of uh, visiting um, this preserve with Mason and him bringing it to our attention, uh, part of these monitoring efforts, we're realizing there's still other rare species that we maybe need to recognize as part of our flora and potentially uh, consider it for, um, for listing and tracking. And then also uh, we're still finding um, additional rare species like in, the, in this plot as we get down, we're really scrutinizing every plant trying to, trying to get down close and not just notice the obvious charismatic species we're, we're able to find uh, additional rare species. Um, and then one area, um, I guess like we don't have, we, have, we haven't looked at a lot of the plot data yet, um, but in the Mammoth Cave Hills, we have a few natural areas and preserves where we're doing a lot of <clears throat> prescribed fire mid-story removal with mastication. Um, and we have a lot of plots out there. So we're excited to see um, how those plots are gonna help us manage habitat for uh, Gentiana puberulenta. Um, and then again, as we're doing these plots, we realize that uh, there are some plants that we see in our plots that we're like, well, that's pretty rare. Uh, we might need to consider if that's something that needs to be uh, tracked or added to the state rare plant list. And then lastly, I just wanted to say that um, there's a lot of plants that we capture for which we capture data in these plots that are conservative, but for which we do not track. Um, so we're not, we, Sometimes these plots are the only way that we can uh, track the, uh, the status of our conservative plants. And with that, um, I thank you guys for letting me present. And um, that's all I have to say. Great, thank you so much, Devin. Um, I am going to uh, I think we have like three minutes for questions. So I'm going to go to the ones that are the most relevant to your talk, uh, like directed at some of the things you had said. The first being from Jonathan Kubash. Um, he asks for vegetation, are any estimates, are there any estimates on biomass production, utilization um, or soil sampling that you do? Um, there, there, hasn't, there hasn't been, soil sampling yet, um, nor biomass estimates. Uh, we are, I guess like our first goal was to um, just get the vegetation data, um, trying to make as much uh, as much of a bang for our buck. Uh, we, we really thought like, let's, let's get our vegetation data and think later about whether or not we want to uh, include uh, some some additional things. Uh, soils. I, I do think soil samples would be a, a great thing it, for for a whole host of reasons. But we have not done that yet. 
Um, great. Uh, Janine Simpson asks, are any of the areas that you've mentioned to, um, available for visiting, perhaps with a guide or in small groups? Um, yes, Some, somewhat yes. Uh, now, because, because we, we were uh, brought, broadcasting this, this to uh, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, people, we, we didn't want to include specific uh, play, names of some of these specific places just because of the sensitivity of the data. But I know if, but I know if, uh, if you contact uh, some of the leadership at Kentucky Native Plant Society, they can, um, they can at least lead you to some of our public preserves. Um, and I know, I know, uh, I know. Sometimes, like, there's been efforts with some of our private preserves to uh, lead hikes on some of them, um, but obviously not something that we've done uh, during COVID. Yes, and then Jonathan asks again: Any tri trifolium reflexum in your plots? Trifolium reflexum. Uh, so we have. Um, we only have a handful of populations in the state, and I think all of them occur on federal land. Wait, wait, there might there might be one on a state forest, but we, we unfortunately don't have any on a nature preserve. We'd like to change that. Um, and Jonathan, we'd love to hopefully utilize your research to identify uh, good sites to introduce uh, Reflexum onto an appropriately um, located uh, preserve. Um, so I think we're going to end to, just to keep on track. There were some questions um, if anyone wants to um, put thing, answers in the chat about like what can be done with reducing mowed grass and uh, trainings. But um, we're going to break for five minutes. Uh, it can be pretty exhausting, even though it's we learn a lot. It can be pretty exhausting to, to be on a Zoom meeting for four hours. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just share the screen of the agenda and we'll come back together at 1110 and start uh, the next talk. And thank you, Devin. That's great. Thank you. <laughs>